one of the uh, great blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the believer is the fact that we can talk to him. That is one of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can have a communication with him without any intermediary. And at the essence of that communication is what we call dua. Dua is calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is when you call upon him that you are no longer connected to anything else in complete dependency on him. And the, the greatest joy of dua is obviously istijaba is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ijabah of Allah that it, he accepts it. That's the greatest joy that is the qabul, that Allah accepts your dua. Now that acceptance, only Allah knows how he accepts it. Immediately deferred in the dunya, in the akhirah. And sometimes he doesn't accept it because Rumi said, sometimes you're asking for a poisonous snake. Ya Allah, give me a poisonous snake. And Allah knows that. So he, he just doesn't want to hear your dua because you, you're harming yourself with that dua. So all of the duas are for a benefit, the response of it from Allah is a benefit for us. But there are five benefits in duas when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first benefit of dua, uh, according to our uh, scholars, is what we call lidda, is this concept of tasting the sweetness of dua because this communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this calling this asking there's a joy in it there's actually a taste in it because everything in life has a taste there's nothing that doesn't have a taste people think it's only food that has taste no sometime you're in a relationship you meet somebody say man this person left a better taste in me right why would you say that because the relationship also has a taste everything in life Life, even death has a taste. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ The Quran said, every soul shall taste death. It's the same word we use for tasting food. Because there's a taste in death as well. There's a taste in worship. And there's this sweetness in this dua. When you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a sweetness that you can taste it. And this is why those people who don't taste this sweetness, they are deprived from one of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man went to Musa alayhi salam and he said, I am in a state of disobedience and I'm this and I'm that. Why isn't it Allah sending me any punishment? Adab for me. Ask him. And Musa alayhi salam asked Allah, ya Allah, why aren't you sending him punishment? He is a man who's straight. He's not on the straight path. And Allah said, tell him, what is a greater punishment that he is not tasting the sweetness of this communication with us of power of dua. That we have removed that from him. That is the greatest punishment we can give him, that he can't call upon us. And this is why Fir'aun, for 40 years, he didn't have a headache. <clears throat> so he doesn't say, Ya Allah, my head hurts. Because that calling upon Allah is so sweet, it is so powerful, it's so beautiful, that is only given to those who are worthy of it. And this is why when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and when is the best time to call? Obviously, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us all of the times that are good, especially the last third of the night, especially at the time of Fajr, after Jum'ah prayer. This is a beautiful time. But one of the best time is Sajda. And this is why when they went to Umm Salama, the wife of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they asked her, what is the dua that the Prophet ﷺ made the most when he was in sajda? He, she said, he used to make this dua, Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh, the turner of the heart, make my, make my heart firm in this deen. This is the dua of the Prophet ﷺ in sajda. So sajda is one of the best places to make dua. Why? Iqbal Rahmatullah Ali said, he said the reason why sajda is so powerful and it is, a, it, it is an amazing place to, to make a dua, he said, Jahad sarjuka. He said, because the heart leads and the intellect bows down. The heart leads, but the intellect bows down where the heart leads. And when you put your intellect on the ground, the heart is elevated over your intellect. 
And then you say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Ala, you are the most high ya Allah. And that's the place where there's no barrier between you and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Everything has to be removed from the place that you're making sajda to the seventh heaven. There's a spiritual cosmic shift that happens when we are in sajda, in that moment. And there's nothing between us and Allah. And that's the best time to make dua. And that is the benefit of dua. One of the, the, the number one benefit is to taste this. And this is why there are people who don't taste the sweetness of their worship. Iqbal said, Sajda is to ibadat me mazaatahe. If Sajda is done with love, it is then that you taste the sweetness of your worship. The Prophet وسلم, told us about prayer, about, about dua. A dua mukhlil ibadah. It is the innermost core of ibadah. It is the it is the most amazing thing about ibadah is dua. Dua calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A dua silahul mu'min. It is a weapon of the believers. We have this spiritual weapon that can turn the heavens and the earth upside down and right side up. It can. That's the power of dua, because Allah can do fa'alun lima yurid. He can do whatever he wants. But we have to ask, and we have to ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the problems of our time. We go to every door before we go to Allah. That's the last door we go instead of being the first door. So the first thing is to taste the sweetness of this because there is a sweetness in the ibadah. There's a sweetness in calling upon Allah. Uh, Mawlana Rumi has a story about a man who used to always make dhikr. And they ask him, why do you make dhikr all the time? He said, I call upon Allah all day, all night because it's so sweet. My mouth becomes sweet from this remembrance. Sheikh Muhammad al Yaqubi, half of Allah, the great scholar from Syria, he said that the scholars who are in dhikr, they forget about drinking water because their mouth becomes moist from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the, this is the, the, the first benefit of making dua. The second benefit is tawassal. This connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You sever yourself from the world of asbab and you go to musabbib. You go to the one who is the creator of asbab. And it is then that this relationship is very unique. Fafirru Allah And run to Allah. Yusuf alayhi salam was not running away from Zulaikha. He was not running away from Zulaikha. No prophet would run away from anybody. He was running to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, when you are in that station of tawakkul and trust for Allah and you have that relationship, it is then that you see the world of Asbab is all means. It is Allah that's doing all that. It is not the medicine that heals you. It's the healing that Allah put in the medicine that heals you. When you take that medicine, you know that Allah has put that healing in the medicine. And this is a this is a way of the, this is our aqidah. We don't believe medicine heals if Allah doesn't want to heal you. But we know that this is the world of asbab, and He put the healing in the medicine. And that's the way of the Muslims. So you cut yourself from going to every door instead of door of Allah. So the first door you go is the door of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The first door that we go is the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next thing that it does, the third thing, benefit of dua, it removes anxiety, it removes depression, it removes anger and hatred towards people. And this is one I think in the Matarat al Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud writes that if you have hatred towards somebody, you have, you're angry with someone, you have bukul, you have all of these towards a, another family member or a friend or a or community member, right? He said, how do you remove that? They said, make dua for them. The fact that you make dua for them, Allah will remove that from your heart. This is the, this is the power of dua because it's like a cleansing. Dua comes in and wash everything away from your heart because the heart is a place for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His life, His remembrance. It's not a place to be talking about, to have hatred, of other people or other things in your heart. It's not a place for hate the, the, the heart. So it removes anxiety. It removes because anxieties are there because we have no trust. Once your tawassal 
Once you're connected with Allah, this is the result. Number three is the result of number two. Number two said you have to have tawassul, connection with Allah. Once you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the result of that, everything is will melt away. I once had a thousand desires, but with one desire to know you, everything else melted away. That's Mawlana. Everything melts away when, Allah, when the light of God comes in, with that connection with Allah comes into your heart, everything else will melt away and go away and you will see happiness and joy in your heart. And the next one he said that it will turn your heart into an ocean. It's the sadr, the sharh of the sadr. Your heart will become expansive. It becomes huge. And once your heart becomes like an ocean, he said all of the trials and tribulation of the dunya will be like little boats in the ocean. In other words, you can handle all of them because you become big. When we are, when are we are constricted, one of the things that happens, we bring this dark cloud over us. And then we don't see the sky no more. We think that everything is suffocating. And that's the nature of depression and sadness and, and just constriction comes in. But once the clouds are removed and you see the sun and you see the night sky, you would see the magnificent and the glorious creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is then that you realize, oh my God, what do we have? That's the same thing with the cos. You have the same thing in the cosmos, but you are the cosmos. You are the cosmos. Everything that you see in the heavens and the earth is in you. You are the microcosm of the macrocosm. So removing those clouds of depression, of sadness, by making your chest, your heart, like an ocean. And then all of these things that look like gigantic uh, boats become a little boat in your ocean because you were in a pool, you were in a little creek. Now you turn yourself into an ocean. Everything else will become insignificant and small. And the next thing that he said, he said that uh, the uh, you will find the one that you have lost. You will find the one that you have lost. Dua, alam yajid ki yatiman fa'awa wa wajadaka ba'alan fa'hada. Right? The Quran tells about the Prophet Sallallahu You are orphan, right? Let me take care of you. And then you were wandering. What does a wanderer do? What does a wanderer do? Speaking dua like, you know, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. You are wandering. And we, we gave you guidance. If you make dua sincerely, you will find guidance. And you will find the beloved that you have lost, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is through dua that you find God. Sincerely. There are people who have lost Allah. Nurmi said, he said, I rather lose my limbs, my eyesight, my ear, my hearing, my, my hands, my intellect, my imagination, all of the gift that God has given. I rather lose all of them. Garama dido aqlu kharadu john tumaram. As long as I don't lose you, Ya Allah. Because he knew the greatest loss is when you lose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In reality, is when you lose yourself. Because when you lose Allah, you lose yourself. You become worthless. And Rumi said, I know, one thing I know, that if I'm with you, I'm a diamond. But if I'm not with you, I'm a worthless rock. Who are you? Who are you, oh God, that you turn a worthless rock into a diamond? And a diamond into a worthless rock. If I'm with you, I'm a diamond. But I'm not with you, I'm a worthless rock. May Allah make us amongst the people who are people of remembrance and dua, being people like the diamond, not like the worthless rock. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Dua is the essence of this deen. The Prophet ﷺ told us something really beautiful. All his statements are beautiful. He says, sometimes the dunya 
becomes very tasteful to you. Sometimes the junior, right? This is the nature of the junior, become tasteful. You enjoy the junior too much. How do you get rid of that nature? How do you get rid of that just enjoying the dunya too much? He said, Akhtar wa zikri hazimun that. Do much remembrance of the destroyer of that sweet thing. Right? What is that sweet? The sweetness of the dunya. With what? With dhikr of moat. With remembrance of death. Because it kills the sweetness that comes from the things of this dunya. So you're not drowned in the ocean of desires and passion. Everything has a taste. Life has a taste. Death has a taste. But the greatest taste is not the taste of that which you put in your mouth. It is the taste of the heart. It is the spiritual taste. And that is the power of dua. That is because dua is the only thing that only you know and Allah knows. You don't have to announce it. You don't have to announce it. Only thing is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the power of dua. That when you make dua, you turn to him, Allah knows your heart. And that's why you have to raise your heart as you raise your hand, as you raise your head. You raise your heart towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see the difference. You will see the difference. And in our tradition, we have stories of all these awliya saints and the prophets that made dua, and their dua were accepted. But... Uh, there's a story in the Atar's Memoirs of the Saints. He talks about uh, this wrestler, a Persian wrestler who was the king's wrestler. He was a heavyweight champion, Pahlawan Mahmoud Puriya. He was Mahmoud Puriya. And he was a Pahlawan. He was a, the greatest champion, heavyweight champion of the world, a king of Persia. And then they had a, a king from uh, India that was visiting Persia. And they came in and they had a wrestler. And they had a show for the next day between the two kings and all of the people. So he came in and uh, Bahlawan Mahmoud being the home favorite, he said, let me go see how he trains this man. So he climbs over the, the houses that were in the other quarters and he goes and he looks from the top to see how this wrestler trains, right? To see if he finds his moves, see if he's any good, any competition for him. But he doesn't see him. He sees his mother on a prayer rug and making dua, saying, Ya Allah, don't humiliate my son. This Mahmoud Puriya guy, this, he's a beast. I know he's going to humiliate my son tomorrow in front of the king, in front of what is going to happen to my son coming back to India? Humiliate him. She just cries and makes dua in the courtyard as Bahlawan Mahmoud is listening from the top of the, of the roof. He comes home and he has a dilemma. Uh, Socrates said dilemma, you know, you have dilemma, there's three ways to solve that dilemma. Uh, you go through the horns, you just go straight through it. So he just goes straight through it. And he makes that decision. So the next day they come and they start fighting. And immediately, Bahrain Mahmoud is defeated very easily on his back. And for the first time, he loses his title in front of the king. His family is booing him, throwing stuff at him. You know, because you, you brought the name of our country down. You put our king down. But how many wrestlers' names do we know in the history of Islam? Why do we know Mahmoud Puriya? Because he became a saint just by their mere act. And he said, he said, I had a dilemma that night. My pride, my championship, my family, this is how I make my money. This is how I make a living. The dilemma was, what if that woman goes home and says, Allah didn't hear me. He didn't answer my prayer. Why didn't he answer my prayer? And he realized that he is the means that Allah put between. And that was his greatest test. And he passed by putting himself on the ground. 
the one who humbles himself, Allah elevates him. Allah elevates him. And he became one of the great saints of Persia. He was one of the few wrestlers who became saint. But that's the power of dua. That's the power of dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in mysterious ways. If you can figure out how Allah, how he does things, that's not Allah. You can't figure it out. And that's why whatever you are, wherever you are, if you're in the room and you look all around and it's all walls, then you say, how is Allah going to get me out of this situation? I swear to you by Allah. You even in that walls, He already has an excellent strategy for you. Allah has an excellent strategy for you. All you have to do is fulfill what you don't want. Just turn toward Him. Run toward, don't run away from trials. Don't run away from tribulation. Run away, run to Allah. And you would see that He will make a door from the walls. That's the nature of God. He can do whatever He wants. He can do whatever He wants.